And now I'd like to introduce William Cruz Bermeo, who will be speaking on Latin America on the global fashion scene during the 20th century. William Cruz Bermeo is a fashion and dress history professor in the clothing design program at Universidad Pontificia Bolivia, Bolivariana in Medellin, Colombia. He is considered a local authority on the field of fashion studies, especially in Colombian fashion history. Please join me in welcoming William. Good morning to everybody. I'm very honored to be invited to this panel. Um, it was in December uh, 2021 when Tania Melendez and Melissa Marra from FIT Museum reached me out to ask for my interest in research and write about Latin American fashion in late 20th century. So I decided to start an exploration in order to recognize the presence of Latin American imagery and Latinx people in global fashion industry during the 20th century. When I say global fashion industry in such a long period, I'm referring to the hegemonic fashion systems to the centers that were ruled by then the Western fashions, Paris, New York, Milan, and London. In other words, the Euro-American fashion. Facing the current century, the last uh, century, let us several lessons about the relationship between Euro-American fashion and Latin America. By exploring this relationship, one can learn about Latin America as a muse, its imagery as an inspiration source for designers, Latin America as a background for pictures, its landscapes and peoples in fashion photography, and the contribution of Latino talents to those dominant fashion systems, and last, but not least, the emphasis given by the press to the associations between those talents, styles, and their origins. I consider pertinent this last issue because of the importance given now to the regional identities as a distinctive signature in fashion creation. As a result, my examination of this relationship is currently shaping three lines of research, so I would like to share with all of you some notes uh, about it. First, Latino imagery and culture as a muse. From the rise of modern fashion by mid 19th century, the Euro American fashion has been, has been taking inspiration from cultures from all over all around the world. Um, however, some scholars are critical about these inspirations are used, rising issues of cannibalization, exoticism, objectification, appropriation, and a stereotyping of cultures. Regardless, another scholar favor a more positive examinations of these inspirations, consider them as a locus of creativity or as an appreciated response by fashion designers to their encounters with the different cultures of the world. For example, Andrew Bolton, made a positivistic examination of Orientalism in fashion in his introduction to the China Through the Looking Glass Catalogs exhibition. Um, according to Bolton, designers like Paul Poiret, Yves Saint Laurent, or Jean Galliano used to interpret the Orient as a miracle site, uh, driven less by the logic of politics and more by the logic of fashion. This one usually follows an aesthetic of surfaces rather than an essence of a cultural uh, contextualization. This uh, design approach might be strongly controversial today, but it wasn't like that before the current politicization of fashion. That is to say, before fashion processes were framed in ethical, inclusive, and ecological terms 
as explained by, by Gilles Lipovetsky. Framing the fashion processes in this way requires fashion to hybridize frivolity with ethics, aesthetics, and ecology. It involves a transition from an era of carefree creativity to one of responsible creativity. In contrast, the rule during the 20th century was that fashion could resort without restrictions to any source belonging to any culture, including Latino imagery and cultures. Some cultures were more preferred than others. For instance, in the ethnographic material collected, collected by designer Jenny Lamba during her career, Chinese and Japanese garments stand out. Even so, in fashion museum collections, reference to pre-Columbian cultures are found in so many cases. For example, the Kyoto Costume Institute holds a rubbed steel by Jean Lanvin, embroidered with Aztec pattern, patterns on the skirt. Another example is this creation by Jacques Fa, a camion yellow dress accessorized with a red belt and a hat, both with ink and textile motif at the Victorian Albert Museum. In the 50s, American designer Claire McCarroll produced a bathing suit with red and yellow prints based on Panamanian Kuna tribes motif, which is in the museum at FIT collection. Um, there are plenty of examples, but the purpose here is not to make a complete inventory, but rather to confirm the presence of this reference in Euro-American fashion. Even the fashion press from the early 20th century could give us some insights about the artisanal products from Latin America that have had some influence in designers' creations, as documented by this Vogue fashion editorial featuring two variations of the Panama hat by French designers Jean Patou. In late 20th century, designers kept on taking inspiration from Latin America. Among them was Vivian Westwood, for her Savage and Buffalo Girls collection in early 80s, she drew on the style of the Sholas. These are the women from Andes Mountains who wear bowler hats and full skirts, revealing the sartorial hybridization between European colonists and natives. The images on the screen show the similarities between both the styles of dress. Um, Jean-Paul Gaultier also quoted vernacular clothes from Latin America. In 2007, he resorted to the Sombrero Volteado, a typical hat from the Colombian Caribbean coast. By styling it as a, as a beacon hat for Pirates, his 2008 spring summer collection, the designer ignored any meaning given originally to this hat, and he used it just as one component to structure his own message. Perhaps, not surprisingly, there were not uh, accusations of misappropriation over these fashion statements because they appeared before the politicization of fashion. On the contrary, the Colombian press celebrated when Gaultier quoted the Sombrero Volteado, considering this as a tribute to the local culture and focused on find out how the designer had discovered the Sombrero Volteado. Meanwhile, Vogue, revealed the collection explaining the conceptual traits of the Gaultier show, describing it as an imaginary pirate ship traveling to North America, Africa, and France, and plundering cultural reference. There was, there was absolutely no mention of the referencing of a traditional Colombian hat, something which was so celebrated in the Colombian press. Citations to, to Latin America have included artistic icons such as the Mexican painter Frida Kahlo or political personalities such as the Argentinian first lady Evita Perón. Also Gaultier for his spring summer 1998 ready to wear collection drew on Kahlo. The collection was described by Vogue as a cultural excursion style in which Gaultier Fused Marilyn Manson and Frida Kahlo. Not surprisingly, the review mentioned it mainly to the Kahlo reference, not only because the Mexican painter was an explicit topic of the collection, but also because this artist has a long history on the radar of the American fashion press. That history began with her first appearance in Vogue 
1937 as one of the Senoras of Mexico and the rise of another Rivera, an article about her first exhibition in the United States one year later. Um, both articles prized her native clothes, noting that her dress made Kahlo a product of her art. So her popularity as an attractive icon for Euro-American fashion cannot be said to be recent. Nonetheless, in Vaux's review of Gaultier's collection, all the reference to Latin America were missing. It failed to point out cons the conspicuous presence of plain white Panama hats and some stylings reminiscent of the way women in Latin America used to drape their shawls around themselves in colonial times. Needless to say, the chromatics in that collection, bright red, green, or orange, did not exclusively reference Kahlo. They also reflected, reflected the color explosion usually associated with Latin America. This is a long established trope about the region reproduced in the American fashion press time after time. One can find articles like this one that you can see on the screen from as early as 40s. The article mentioned chili red, blue, yellow, green, and pink as approved Latin American colors for fashion by the but they have to be always softened by the wearing the civilized elegance of black. <clears throat> as we have seen, sometimes fashion journalism exposes a very limited ability to recognize the presence of Latin American reference in representation of representation of the global fashion. This absence of appreciation made Latin American cultures and imagery a silent news in spite of their conspicuous visibility in runway's history. By the other hand, it is hardly possible to maintain that the references of non-Latinx designers, such as those that I have mentioned, were the result of a malicious approach to Latin American imagery and cultures. Rather, I tend to consider this as just another phase of exoticism and um, unfortunately, not always the exoticist is completely aware about what it means, the exoticization of cultures. According to Jennifer Craig, the term uh, exoticism can refer either to the enticing, fetishized quality of a fashion or style, or to foreign or rare motif in fashion. Moreover, uh, she explains that fashion moves on the tension between exotic and familiar codes. In that vein, it might be said that Latin American imagery and cultures, uh, some inspiration source, work in Euro-American fashion as a part of its design strategy to keep that tension. Second, we had Latin America as a, um, as a background for pictures. Latin American urban and rural landscape have been featured in fashion photography largely as a picturesque, mythical setting for fashion editorials, showing Caucasian models in clothes styled by Euro-American brands and designers. The first trace of the region's use as a setting for fashion editorials goes back to 1948, when Vogue sent the fashion photographer Irving Penn to Lima the resultant images were published the following year in two separate stories and editions, flying down to Lima on February 1949, and Christmas at Cusco in the single issue published in December of the same year. Each story takes a different approach to the place, people, landscapes, fashion, and dress. In flying down to Lima, the model plays the role of an American tourist. As a result, the photographer's gaze is expeditionary. A two-week tour contemplating Lima and El Callao focuses on the street and their mood, the colonial architecture, and some historic uh, places. Some pictures involve locals, such as children or a book black, infusing these images with a fabricated anthropological swift suggesting a visual pleasure by capturing what is, cons what is considered a new or uncommon. In fact, that pleasure is usually associated with the kaleidoscopic vision 
of the Tauris. It is that vision that pervades flying down to Lima. Pens, lens, inquires into places and people as if a tourist lens captured them just because of their newness and singularity. The model and her meticulous clothes contrast with the locals' material poverty. The locals, locals work as props for the scene where the model appears projecting the aura of a miracle creature. In the meanwhile, she is encircled by settings which have pictorial qualities and are, by extension, picturesque. Christmas at, uh, at Cusco takes another approach, the exotic. Author uh, Victor Sigalin categorizes exoticism as a sensation, which is nothing other than the notion of difference, the perception of diversity, the knowledge that something is other than one's self. Um, this notion provides an optimistic version of an issue that today is considered detrimental to the cultures observed by the exorcists. Although Sigalin's ideas provide insight into how modern thinking perceives the issue. After all is said and done, Penn was a man whose vision was shaped in the twilight of modernity. However, it, it is his ability to conceive the difference that is seen in Christmas uh, at Cusco. The first story, Flying Down to Lima, was featured as a regular fashion spread, notwithstanding the iconoclastic idea for the time of travel to a picturesque South American setting for a fashion story shoot. Uh, the second story was published as an artwork, as evidenced by this note on the screen from Edward Steichen, comparing Penn's abilities to those of an artist who renders his sitters as a sculpture interested in form or composing the figures in relation to space rather than to the rectangle of the print. However, flying down to Lima has more to tell us about the relationship between Latin America and Euro-American fashion systems. The article boasted of 60 pounds of chlorine brought to Peru for a two weeks for a shoot, all for American retailers and brands. Understandably, there was no room for Peruvian talent since the magazine was the result of the interactions between its own market and audience. Um, the point is, this is, sorry, this fashion story sets a visual trope and a set of practices that will be subsequently repeated ad nauseum well into the 21st century in Euro-American fashion image making in Latin American territories. On one hand, there is a iteration of colonial stereotypes in dress. Some pictures in Flying Down to Lima caption it as a kind of documentary from the land itself exemplify this practice. In one of those, of those pictures, American designs are styled with shawls and Andalusian and Cordovan ha hats, all in reference to bullfighters' war. Seems obvious, but all these references are more from Spanish origins than Peruvian, more related to the Spanish cultural impact on Latin America. On the other hand, some years later, Artisanal products will be used as styling accessories without any credit to their creators. If fashion editorials are, to some extent, a promotional mechanism, it will, see be, it will see to be only proper to give credit for those items. In addition to their symbolism, artisanal products are made by master artisans and involve production networks with their own economic di dynamics. Since 1948, Peru has frequently been the scene of many fashion editorials, often treated with the imperialistic width of 19th century explorers, both in their visual and textual rhetoric. Uh, this is especially so in two examples featured in American Vogue, Inca Metrics, shot by Norman Parkinson for the 1966 issue and The Explorer, Fashion That's All Your for the Discovery, by John Cohen two years later. As is well known, Peru is celebrated for its traditional world textiles, and the story featured some ruanas, 
but they all came from a store in Greenwich Village. If these ruanas were or not a Peruvian manufacturer was not relevant to the magazine, overriding all was the fact that they had been shot at the medical and overwhelming uh, Machu Picchu. Apparently, the rule was no credits to artisans, no promotional plans for a local fashion, just a set of props and backgrounds, giving the images that necessary as edgy of picturesque, exotic, and miracle atmosphere. Even at the beginning of the 21st century, when Arthur Elgort was sent to Brazil to photograph this editorial, the wardrobe selection did not include garments by Brazilian designers. A notable omission considering that by then, Brazil was already on the map of global fashion geography. The theory is Latin America as a, as a talent pool, or a talent pool. Argentinian sociologist Susana Solkin recalls how in the early 90s, some Bonaerenses designers established, established a sort of diaspora in New York. Some Colombian talents in design will do the same by the, late, by, by the late 90s, migrating to different countries or changing their aspirations. A list of designers' brands debuting at Colombia Moda from 19s to 2000s reveals that only a few of them continue in the local business of fashion today. In October 2000, um, Harper's Bazaar Mexico featured a report on Moda in Mexico, an article which portrayed existing local creators intending to present a portrait of what was happening in Mexican fashion while the country was living a real social, cultural, and political explosion. However, in 2017, Gustavo Pardo revised that piece is observing that by looking at that generational portrait, one wonders if it is not a summary of the 20th century rather than a vision of the future that was to come. Since, le since less than 20 years later, it was already unremarkable that the vast majority of them had gone in a different way. Referring to Paris, Barry still argues that French fashion system's ability to attract for foreign, foreign talent has been crucial to its continuing success. The same could be said about Latin American fashion system, specifically in New York, sorry, about American fashion system, specifically in New York, which historically was shaped by talents from all around the world, including those of Latinx. By taking, by taking part in Euro-American fashion, Latinx, have involved themselves in multiple fields of the, in the industry, illustration, modeling, photography, design, and certainly consumption. From the beginnings of the 20th century, some Latinx already had an, an active role in the global fashion industry, although known as designers. Peruvian artist Reinaldo Lusa arrived to New York in 1918 one year later, he was an illustrator for Vogue, where he continued until 1921, and then took the same role at Harper Fassard until the uh, 50s. Modeling by Latinas in Euro-American fashion industry has been ready in marginal prior to the rise of Brazilian models in the late 19s. Uh, before that, just one Latina model is on the records of fashion uh, of fashion. Argentina, Dinian uh, Coca Gaspar Denise, as the model herself recalls to European uh, features, look at Incan. Latino photographers have also been involved in the global fashion industry. Um, Colombian Rubén Afanador and Peruvian Mario Testino being the most uh, prominent in 20th century. Nevertheless, the presence of Latinx as fashion designers in the heart of Euro-American fashion goes back to the late 50s. Apparently, there was a common path for mid-20th century Latinx designer who saw an international career in American fashion. First, to succeed in the United States, they needed to prove technical training 
as evidence of their skills and, at the same time, carry an air or being tortured by a Parisian fashion sense. This fashion sense was acquired by being trained at Parisian ateliers before they set their own business in the United States. In the process, they had to acquire a strong knowledge of production, processes, and above all, of American tastes. Doing so implied to understand the possibilities of sportwear, which is so deeply rooted in New York's fashion and of functional luxury. This was like speaking to language, which had to be merged with a their, their, their own vision of style and Latino sensibility. I mention New York because of its pivotal role as a fashion center and cultural hub. It is, it is in its cultural milieu where designers such as Luis Esteves, Adolfo Sardinia, Oscar de la Renta, and Carolina Herrera could flourish. So let's take a quick look at these Latinx uh, designers. Born in Cuba in 1930, Luis Esteves started his, started his career in 1955, even though he studied architecture in Havana. Esteves' fashion design perspective were shaped in New York and Paris. By 1956, Life magazine reported that Esteves' success story took just one year, and the magazine saw fit to mention his novel origins dating back to the 18th century. This was not a trivial fact. In the 50s, consumers, especially those in the growing middle class, valued social respectability. Thus, a link between a designer and nobility could be more resonant than the expression of a Latino identity in his design aesthetic. Now, with his standing, his flowing and very conscious style was already surfaces, surfacing in his late 50s design. The Museum of Fit preserves an example which epitomizes this crucial stage in his career. Moreover, it's possible to suggest an association between this emerging style and Esteves' Latino origins. Uh, historically, Latin America and the Caribbean has been associated with the rhythm, music, and songs and dance that generate free body movements requiring fluid and body conscious clothing. In designing this garment, he seems to link an essence of a Caribbean past with the spirit of his time in America. The Supima cotton advertisement featuring the dress describing its Caribbean evocations as a garment flaming a tropic bloom will set him as a mambo beat. By, by the late 50s, we also have to Adolfo Sardinia from Cuba. He started his career as a millionaire and established his own salon in New York in 1963. Sardinia also was trained in the tradition of Parisian haute couture and American retail expertise. He retired from designer design in 19... 93 to concentrate on his licensee business. It's better to close a business when you are doing well done out of sheer necessity, he told to the New York Times. Regardless of his undeniable commercial success and position as a favorite of wealthy American women, his design were very derivative, following the lead of Chanel and Yves Saint Laurent in their different stage. However, on that issue, Sardinia explained that he was creating a feeling of Chanel, an illusion of her. And finally, we have to do mention to the work of Oscar de la Renta, um, who comes from the uh, Dominican Republic, and he shared with Esteban and Sardinia an early training in the Parisian fashion uh, retailers. Um, we have here some examples about uh, how he was covered by the press. Um, Bernadine Morris, who was one of the women who chronically the vertiginous rise of the, uh, de la Renta in the New York Times, was very enthusiastic about his clothes, but he not always associated his style 
with his, or with, with his origins. However, in his um, designs, one can see uh, the roots of Latino identity. In, it was in the context of the wealthy woman seduced by couture that Carolina Herrera, born in Venezuela, shaped her own fashion sensitivities. Actually, her attendance at Balenciaga showed them uh, show when she was just 13. It's a familiar story and biographical report that, that aim to explain her meticulous vision of a style. Um, with her, I want to finish my uh, presentation just to mention uh, something of the origin and connecting with the idea that the, the, that the link between our culture and one American sense of a style needed to be successful in the American territories. Thank you.